Well, the message of a good boss, bad boss, if I was to summarize it in a few sentences, um, that, that if you think about what it takes to make a great boss, there's lots of things they do, but there's a thread that runs through it, which is that the best bosses find ways to be in tune with uh, the people they lead, so they understand um, what it feels like to work for them, which is sort of almost like a trite and obvious comment. But where it gets more interesting is there's actually a large body of social psychological research that shows that the more power you give people, the more oblivious they become to the people they lead. So in many ways, um, the most effective leaders find ways to overcome this sort of obliviousness. And, and the other part about it, which is quite interesting, is there's a lot of research that shows that when you put people in positions of power, they're watched very, very closely by the people they lead. And apparently this is related to how we're wired as not just human beings, but as apes. There is some uh, cool research that shows that in the baboon troops, that uh, the alpha male is stared at by members of the troop every 20 to 30 seconds. And, and so that's, if you will, the thread that runs through the book that is that the best bosses find ways to be in tune with their people and then they try to accomplish two goals. Uh, the first goal is performance or their competence, and the second one is uh, humanity or to enhance people's dignity. But this idea of being in tune is the key idea in the book. What would I, that's a great question. What would I like to see happen with the book? Well, I mean, there's a couple of things I would like to see happen, probably more than anything else. I would like to see it influence or at least affect a conversation in organizations about what a great boss is because one of the main things that um, inspired the book um, is uh, my last book, which was The No Asshole Rule, and I was deluged with comments, both conversation and literally thousands of emails. And one of the main characters in all of those emails, or actually 80%, I counted them, there were several thousand emails, was the boss. Either it was somebody who had a bad boss and didn't want the boss to be a jerk often, or it was somebody who was a boss and wanted to not be a jerk. But the thing that also came out of that <coughs> was, was the notion that people, um, it, they weren't just concerned about civility or being treated kindly. They actually wanted to either be a competent boss or work for a competent boss. So, so sort of the short story is, is what comes out of that is hopefully um, the, the way that organizations will define and breed bosses are people who, to go back to the key sort of definition of a good boss versus a bad boss, people who are both competent, drive performance, and are civilized and viewed um, by the people who work for them as treating them with dignity. And to me, if you only get one of those two um, outcomes, you are in some ways a failure as a boss. But it's not an easy thing to do because it is a balancing act. Well, well probably what inspired it, and I, I've already referred to this in some ways, um, was that when I wrote um, the No Asshole Rule, I was deluged with, the, deluged with these emails, uh, many of which were actually about bosses. That was the primary theme. But another thing I think that influenced me in writing the book was that I realized in, in the various organizations I was studying and the ones that I was working with was whether or not um, I was talking to the CEO of a large company or a first line supervisor or like a, a good friend of mine is actually a cop. He works at, in Hillsborough. And, um, and he's, he's a captain and he also heads the sniper unit of the local SWAT team. So he's like a boss. But who, whoever I was, I was um, talking with, the notion that there were bosses um, who had immediate charges that they had to deal with in one way or another, <coughs> those sort of relationships I think are really important in organizational life. And although there's a whole bunch of other issues like strategy and how you structure the organization, which I do touch on some, to me, the, the key part that was interesting was this relationship between the, the boss and the immediate sort of human relationships that they have with the people they work with and lead most directly are something that, as I say, I, I can talk about it with Nick. I can talk about it with a first line supervisor. And uh, recently I've been doing some work with groups of CEOs. And the whole thing they talk about is their team and all the problems of keeping their team together. And in fact, if you look at uh, some recent research on firm performance, it turns out that one of the primary ways that a CEO has an effect on um, firm performance is through the team that he or she puts together and manages um, directly. 
because they, they can't run around and do everything. They've kind of got to delegate to their immediate team. So, so to me, it was simply something that was important from both a performance standpoint and the emotional and physical well-being of uh, people in all sorts of jobs. So, so the, the question of how this book relates to my earlier book, The No Asshole Rule, well, as I already mentioned, that it, it relates in the notion that there's lots of, um, there was a lot of um, response about bosses and from bosses, but it, it also relates in that there's a chapter called um, On Boss Holes. So I, so I stole that from uh, the Urban Dictionary, the term boss hole. And, and the point of that chapter is, uh, first of all, that um, there's a whole bunch of things about being a boss, putting people in a position of authority over somebody else. It's one of the most reliable ways to turn somebody into a jerk that you can imagine. Because uh, first of all, there's power poisoning. I already mentioned this. You start becoming oblivious to the people you're leading. Um, there's the time pressure that comes with it because you usually have more time pressure. You're, you're held accountable for performance and you're blamed very often when things go wrong, whether or not it's your fault. And then often um, being a boss these days, there's a lot of sleep de deprivation and exhaustion. Those are great ways to turn people into jerks. And so one of the things that, that I emphasized and I thought about more in this case where I was focusing on bosses is that this notion that um, bosses um, need to be civilized and need to be in tune with their people, that there's something about the job they have that they have to fight a whole bunch of tendencies that are going to lead them in the opposite direction, which is to be insensitive, selfish, and probably incompetent in some ways. So, so I think that that's another, another thing that sort of, uh, sort of came from it. And you know, when I look at the stories of what um, bosses do to their employees, it is absolutely unbelievable. There was, there was actually um, a consulting uh, firm uh, somewhere in the Midwest where they had a company picnic and they wanted to motivate people to, um, to sell more because they weren't selling enough. And they essentially waterboarded somebody at a picnic. To, to, and it's one of those things that you just can't believe that it happened. But it's just one of those sort of weird things. And the boss was actually sort of a nice but very aggressive guy. And, 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 he was, and so the boss was dumping the water down the guy's throat. And he was, saying, he was saying, see how hard he's struggling? This is how hard you should be struggling for sales. And so there's something about the position. And this was a pretty nice guy that, that sort of leads people to do um, sort of idiotic and cruel things at times. So, that, so I guess that would be some of the links back to the, to the no asshole rule. And then, and then the other link, since for better or worse, I've been condemned to be a, a research professor much of my life, is that um, as with this book and my prior books with Jeff Effer too, um, I try to make an evidence-based case for everything I do. So there's lots of stories, like the, the waterboarding story, story is in there, but um, the basis of everything comes from a series of peer, peer review studies. So that tends to be what I draw on. Yeah, so it is sort of interesting. I, 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 so um, what, the way that I think that the good companies are addressing the concerns raised in the book, and, 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 and one of the perspectives in the book, which also has been emphasized by Gallup researchers, is that although the CEOs and senior executives and companies tend to get a huge amount of the credit or the blame, if you look at what probably matters more for performance, it's sort of the average quality of leadership or management in the organization that really matters, not whether or not the CEO or even the top team tend to be great. And so the way that I think that some of the best firms, so I'm thinking of uh, General Electric, Procter & Gamble, and there's also some amazing um, Asian firms that are starting to really have an impact. I've been working with the Singapore government lately. They really get this. And it's the notion that to be a great organization, they've got to have a, not one, but a bunch of great leaders who are, if you will, competent and treat their people with dignity and respect. And so, so I think that is a competitive advantage, and there's pretty good evidence about this, that, um, that, that firms have. And it's not just the focus on the CEOs, and it's always entertaining to talk about CEOs because we love to blame them or may, and occasionally worship them, although we seem to be in a period of mud throwing rather than worshiping. Um, but, um, but, but still, it's sort of the people who do, in many ways, uh, the more ordinary, less flashy things that keep organizations going and determine the, the difference between the best and the worst. And in fact, since we're at Stanford, um, one of our most distinguished and smartest and most charming um, emeritus professors is James March, who 
by some accounts came fairly close to winning the Nobel Prize last time. And um, one of the things Jim March has been saying for a long time is that simple competence in organization um, is one of the most important and underrated things. It's not very exciting, but it's one of the things that really distinguishes the difference between you know, good, great, mediocre, and lousy firms. So, uh, so I guess this is part of that call for sort of simple competence. Well, the book is, is coming out in about a month, so I'm just now sort of getting some of the reactions and reviews and the like, which are generally positive. But um, where I've really sort of felt the response are when I talk to groups of executives and other managers about the ideas in the book. And uh, there's two sorts of responses, and I always think it's important to emphasize negative responses as well as positive responses, even though we're always selling books. Um, in that some people will sometimes say, well, this is obvious. I knew this already. Um, but I think that's also a point of the book, and actually a lot of work I've done with Jeff Effer too, is that the, the best leaders and best bosses are often masters of, of the obvious. And, and where I think that it does have a positive effect, in fact, I'm thinking of a, of a group of CEOs that I did a, a workshop with. So this was, this was a group of 15 CEOs of large local technology companies. And um, the reason I think that session worked was they all became quite introspective about their management style and how it felt like to work for them and things that they could do to become more in tune with the people they, they led. And they, and they talked quite openly about mistakes they made. So what, they'd make decisions where they'd run over people, they wouldn't talk to them, uh, they wouldn't understand how upsetting a small decision was. One of them actually described uh, simply the the concept of sort of like taking away the donuts in the morning, you couldn't believe how upset people got to save money. I mean, just little things like that. Um, and, and then also talking about times when they thought they'd done a good job of, of getting other people's perspective by listening to them, by engaging in constructive conflict with them. So, uh, so, so to me, I think when the book is useful, it creates some introspection and some conversation about how I can number one, be more in tune with uh, the people I lead, and number two, find ways to be both, if you will, more competent and more benevolent, or as I describe it in the book, uh, to enhance performance and also the human dignity of the people they lead. Um, so, so I think that's when it works, and, and not everything works every time, but I'm having some success with that.